Hello and welcome to Sounds Heal Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Brown, and thanks so much for joining me as we continue to explore the fields of sound therapy, sound healing, and using sound for health and wellness. I'm really excited to bring this fascinating conversation to you with Kimberly Shipke. Kimberly is a biomedical engineer who, through her own health crisis, discovered alternative medicine, integrative medicine, and has now merged her engineering background into research in energy medicine. We specifically talk about the biofield, and that term, that word, is something that we hear so much in the sound therapy, sound healing world. So we really get in detail about what is the biofield, what do we know about the biofield, and also significant technology when it comes to biofield science and research. Kimberly is doing amazing and inspiring work, and I'm thrilled to bring this podcast episode to you. This episode is sponsored by the Ohm Shop and Spa, and the Ohm Shop is all about helping you raise your vibration and bring yourself in tune. They offer a vast array of sound healing and vibrational medicine tools, and they have the country's largest showroom of quartz crystal singing bowls. They're located in Sarasota, Florida, but you can also check them out anytime at theomshop.com where they have a wonderful learning center and blog, and you can follow their online sound healing journeys. I've been lucky enough to teach some classes there at the Ohm Shop, and I can tell you from experience that it's a great place to get guidance and direction if you're ready to up-level your sound healing practice, get some tools, or if you're ever in Sarasota, do consider stopping in and visiting with them. Thanks so much for their sponsorship, and please enjoy this podcast with Kimberly Shipke. Well, okay, so, you know, you're a biomedical engineer who's also involved in alternative and integrative medicine, so let's trace back to how you got to where you you are now, uh, maybe starting with your background and influences early on leading you to your focus on biomedical engineering. Well, I actually had an interview uh, last week and we, she was able to help me pinpoint that <laughs> kind of point in my life. And it was a career fair when I was in uh, the second or third grade and they had all these different professionals. And there was a, a doctor there who, funnily enough, especially around this time, had taught us how to, ha- how to wash our hands uh, and scrubbing under the nails and in between the fingers and around the back. And so um, that kind of sparked me and, and just kind of fascinated me and hearing more about being a doctor. So um, I grew up in an engineering family. So my sister went into uh, mechanical engineering, so did my brother. And, you know, when I found out that there was a biomedical engineering, you know, knowing that I wanted to go into medicine, um, I decided to go into that degree. I always thought of the human body as the most amazing machine uh, with pumps and valves and circuits and programming and all that kind of thing. So I I went into uh, biomedical engineering, got my master's uh, as well, uh, focusing on heart valves. So, which is interesting because that's the source of sound in the body. And now, you know, I do a lot of work now with sound. So sound and light. So um, that was kind of my early educational background. My first job was overseeing clinical trials which really kind of freaked me out. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then, um, and then I, that inspired me to go into more physics-based medicine. Um, I had a healing crisis that doctors couldn't figure out. So I went to Boulder and acupuncture, homeopathy and shining a green laser on me worked. I felt like a brand new woman and it only cost about $25 for the homeopathic remedy. Mm-hmm. I was just blown away. Mm-hmm. So the biomedical engineer in me uh, and you know, have been overseeing clinical trials for pharmaceutical companies, I wanted to go into research and research some of these, you know, healing techniques that have been around for, you know, centuries, like acupuncture, and, you know, being able to study the energetic effects with different technologies. So that was kind of my more main focus in getting me inspired into this work. Um, Went to a conference in Colorado, 
uh, the International Society for the Study of Subtle Energy and Energy Medicine, ICEM, and met Beverly Rubick, who wrote the Biofield Hypothesis, and uh, Claude Swanson, who wrote Life Force, The Scientific Basis, and uh, Carl Merritt, who's also a biomedical engineer and an MD who's studying energy medicine. And they've just been real inspirations for me throughout my um, journey in this research. So they got me started into um, studying the biofield, which is the energy that's around the body that you can't see. And um, so the first technology I used was thermal imaging, which is like being able to map the weather patterns on the body. Like we watch the news and we see where the, where it's getting hot and cold so we can prepare. Same thing for the human body. It's being able to see where's their inflammation. You know, a lot of aging is all comes down to inflammation in the body. So being able to see these, you know, use different technologies to study different parts of the field, which are normally invisible. So that's kind of what got me started. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know really too much. Right. So really kind of a, a science background, but there was this shift, this health crisis um, that you must have been just looking for any alternative. And, and that's kind of what brought you into energy medicine. Yeah. 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 It was, I had a seizure and mm. pretty much died. I died. I was you know, no heartbeat. Wow. And you know, the funny thing is, is uh, a guy named Eric Darwin uh, saved my life, you know, gave me mouth to mouth, brought me back, had a reset. And that was when I was still overseeing clinical trials and, you know, seeing all this pharmaceutical model. And, you know, they, when I was dizzy, the doctors told me, well, you know, you, it could go away or you could have it for the rest of your life, take Dremamine. And I was like, Dremamine mm -hmm. for the rest of my life? No. So I went up to Boulder and that's when I started to explore something else mm -hmm. and found physics, really. Yeah. Well, so, and you mentioned already the biofield, and I know in sound work, we hear that term all the time, but usually it's pretty vague when people mention it, they, that they, um, you know, say a few things about it, but not really in depth about what is the, the biofield and what is it related to, um, and the electric nature of the body. Could you talk about the biofield yeah. a bit more and, and your favorite way to kind of explain what it is? Well, I like to, again, kind of go down to particle physics where you have a nucleus uh, with your proton and your nu neutron, and then it's surrounded by an electron cloud. Um, and so that cloud around the body, that torsion, that spin of energy around the body, around the nucleus, um, is its own field. It's got an electric field. And, uh, and so then when you space that out into molecules, tissues, um, organs, human body, you know, it, it's a very complex field. Um, even each cell has its own field. Each tissue has its own field, every organ. And so they're just, uh, which all build up to one. And so, and we're also connected to, you know, intermined with the, the trees that are around us and the field that they give off, um, the energy that's coming through in the wind, you know, how that affects our energy field the temperature of the space that we're in, how that changes our energy field, um, how we respond to these different electromagnetic um, pulses through nature, uh, whether that's light or sound or, or temperature, as I said, uh, different degrees of radiation, you know, they use x-rays. It's all part of the same uh, spectrum. They're all harmonics of each other. And what did you what have you found in in your research for example maybe early on with the the temperature changes with the um well, around the body what did you find yeah one of the first um things that i wanted to see was a qigong master hmm. and i was doing an interview when i was in holland and um and his wife uh, renska she you know, it was a Qigong master. And so when she came home, we, we set up and we did a little study and we measured the temperature in the palms of her hands. And then she said, are you ready? And I said, yes. And within a minute mm -hmm. or less, she had increased the temperature in the palms of her hands by over one degree, which is considered significant in uh, thermal imaging research, that that's a significant shift in temperature for the body. And she just did that with her thought. 
and her intention mm -hmm. and her power. And this woman had just given, had given birth and is still breastfeeding at this time. And she still had that kind of power. I was like, amazed. I was like, do it girl. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've had other people who, you know, who, once I show that picture, they're like, oh, I can do that. And they've tried and it doesn't even change at all. Not even a 0.01 degrees. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she was definitely doing something. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also um, studied with Eileen McCusick. She did a, she came and did a, a tuning on a person's back and we were filming with a thermal imaging camera. And I really wish uh, that I could have had video of it because she was tuned one side of the body at a time. And it was like half of his back would flicker red hot when she would strike this tuning fork and start to tune into his field. And then as the sound drained down, the temperature went down and then she'd strike it again and it would flare back up again. Mm -hmm. And he was noticing energy sensations in his body as this uh, coherent sound was you know, interacting with his energy field and his body was auto tuning to it. Uh, there were you know, significant shifts in temperature there too. So but like I said, unfortunately that wasn't recorded. So that's just, me sitting there with my jaw open, like, oh, do you see this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, um, so yeah, it, it's been an, an interesting uh, journey with thermal imaging and, um, and energy work, for sure. Now, I know you had some collaborations with Dr. Valerie Hunt and Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher. Could you talk a little bit about how that went? Um, what exactly mm -hmm. you were looking into and maybe just a little bit about each of them and your experiences with them. Absolutely. So um, after I went to the, at the conference I went to in Colorado, which I spoke to you about earlier, mm -hmm. um, I met Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher. She's a nuclear and astrophysicist who had developed an external pacemaker. Uh, and because I, you know, I'm a fresh biomedical engineer out of college, you know, looking for something new and interesting, um, hearing about an external pacemaker really kind of turned some light bulbs on in my, and so I offered to come and live with her for a month and help uh, take care of her and do some chores around the house, cooking, whatever. And so we'd sit there um, side by side and she would give me more and more papers to read. I was also really interested in lasers because that was um, something that had been used on me in Colorado before that just kind of blew my mind. And so I went down a coherent light rabbit hole um, and, uh, and so she gave me more and more books. And so then it was, became much more about the, than this pacemaker. She's showing me her research from, uh, Stanford research Institute and the star stargate project with remote viewing mm -hmm. and showing me pictures of, and ex telling me these stories about how she didn't believe it was real at first. And then it's like, okay, well, we'll do this study. And she'd have one student at the university, and another student be given a GPS coordinate. And so once the student would get, go to that GPS coordinate, the student back at the university would try to draw um, whatever they, you know, kind of popped into their mind. So what happened would be, for example, a student at the university would draw a sailboat and the person at the GPS coordinate was at the marina. Mm -hmm. So they would choose places where it's, you know, that statue or it's definitely, you know, um, that landmark that they're drawing and that's where the student is and so it kept happening over and over again and it was eventually the research was taken up by the, the government who had sponsored it mm -hmm. and it's just recently been declassified so more and more about the research uh stargate project is coming out now mm -hmm. um so that's really exciting and what's your understanding of how that works and how is it's related to the biofield remote viewing well, I mean, whether it's related to the biofield, I mean, I think that that, you know, tapping into the ether, I think, you know, the biofield is, is infinite. You know, we talk about our human biofield, but how that interacts with, with the world and with, with other people's um, biofields, however many miles away, mm -hmm. you know, we can think about our friends and then suddenly they call us, you right. know, kind of, you know, you don't know how you're tuning into it, but you're tuning into it. And so, you know, if you have that thought of, you know, I want to go to this GPS coordinate and you set your mind to that, then, you know, anything's possible. Um, just seeing what you draw. I mean, they were able to train military engineers how to do this, who can do AutoCAD drawings and were able to draw 
accurate descriptions of these GPS coordinates when we were at war with Russia. And then we're able to, you know, later go and take a look at these places and they were very accurate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's incredible. So, you know, the power of the mind, mm -hmm. uh, amazing. Yeah. And I, I believe there's research, of course, this would just be in a room that you, people can sense, uh, energy coming off other people, right? Chaotic energy or coherent energy. I, I would assume that could be done across the world too. Well, and I've also lived in India and was traveling through Rajasthan. We stopped for lunch one time and I was the only woman in this restaurant mm -hmm. <laughs> and I could feel the eyes on me, mm -hmm. you know, everything just like looking. And so I would just turn my head and I would just look at each one of them and they would all just kind of like, I'm not looking at you kind of spin their heads around, but I had to, I couldn't even eat because it was like, there was so much intensity coming off people's eyes that I just had to go and unlock eyes with everybody. Like I see you. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> then I could finally eat. So, you know, you can really sense those, those types of things. And I, you know, I know animals can feel it as well. So we're animals. It's another means of communication in a way. Yeah, it's being able to sense into your environment. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in biofield tuning, we, we can find a lot of um, charge at the outside edge of our bubble. Like the earth has a magnetosphere and the sun has a heliosphere. The human body also has this double layer plasma membrane. And so that charge really um, interacts with the rest of the world. So how do you interact with your environment when you meet somebody else? Does that create dis dissonance between you and them? Mm -hmm being able to find where that that charge is and where are you open and free and you know really open and connected to the rest of the world and open to whatever information is coming back in from the world um or are you just living in your charged bubble mm -hmm. and not grounded and just charged so yeah well before we get to kind of technology uh, both high tech and, and low tech with the biofield would you talk a little bit about dr Va valerie hunt as well oh yes so uh valerie hunt she wrote the book the infinite mind mm -hmm. and she did some of the first research into the chakras in the 1970s at ucla mm -hmm. and she measured these areas which are either side of the nerve plexus that runs along the midline of the body along the vagus nerve she would put sensors which measure micro voltage changes. So um, most EEG, EKGs, that's all um, millivoltage and micro voltage is more like the noise. So what they call the noise, um, but that's really information is what we find. So um, she did some work with energy healers uh, in the biofield and the, these chakra measurements on the body and being able to sense these really subtle changes uh, in the body. So. I was able to, um, her device kind of got cannibalized at the university and they stopped making the sensors. So when I met her, she, um, well, she had asked me to be her assistant for a week. And so I did that. And the first name that I wrote down um, was Paul Mawson who had uh, recreated her device using more um, up-to-date sensors. And so, you know, she passed away and I didn't know how I was going to meet this guy. And it turned out he was living uh, in the same town as me in Colorado wow. <laughs> and was able to train me on the system. Um, about the time that I was contacted by the Kundalini Research, research Project, um, who wanted to me to do some research into Kundalini. So we had a, a guy who was selected by the uh, Kundalini research team, and he was sent down from the Himalayas. And we were able to do some measurements uh, on the top of the mountain. Unfortunately, the um, sensors got too hot. They kind of melted oh. in India. So we weren't able to um, collect good data with that system. But mm. uh, it was pretty exciting to be able to be part of that project. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. What would you have found if that the equipment survived? You know, hopefully <laughs> that will be. A revived project in some way, yeah. Well, it was kind of inter interesting anyway. I, I was kind of glad that the sensors malfunctioned because mm -hmm. some of the, you know, when he was trying to raise his kundalini, he was having a hard time um, doing that when I was taking measurements. Mm -hmm. And he asked himself when we came down, 
he'd asked himself why he couldn't do it. And he said it was because of me in his energy field. <laughs> and I thought, oh, you know, as a woman. And oh, I said, oh, well, that's, what I find interesting is that um, it just so happened the stars aligned that I had started my period on that day. Hmm. And so I had a lot of energy, a lot of iron down in my lower chakras. Mm -hmm. And um, it also made me think about um, XX versus XY, the amount of information mm -hmm. there, the subatomic electricity um, in women. So it definitely became a turning point for me that instead of getting my PhD and studying um, these men from the Himalayas, I'd much rather study women with more information XX mm -hmm. um, and the power of the moon. Uh, <laughs> it's really, it's a cosmic connection that, um, so that's definitely, even though I couldn't, you know, get good data, uh, I'm still grateful for what I learned, um, mm -hmm. in that session. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's talk a little bit about significant technology when it comes to biofield science and research. And of course, you've mentioned a couple different things, but this is all away from high tech devices than, um, down to what I would consider more low tech, like the tuning fork. But, you know, what are some high tech uh, research instruments that are commonly used? Well, we have the high tech would be the super uh, quantum interference detection device, the squid magnetometer. That's something that they use to uh, be able to measure even a muscle twitch uh, in an uh, energy field. They use that also for studying the field of the heart with heart math, mm -hmm. being able to see how far out that field when somebody expresses love and gratitude, mm -hmm. how far they can feel and sense that magnetic field uh, emanating from someone. Um, and then, like I said, thermal imaging, that's like the thermosphere of the body. Uh, we've been kind of limited by the capabilities of technology in the past, but now they have cameras that are sensitive out to 0 0.01 and 0 0.001 degrees so that we can see more subtle changes uh, when we're wanting to do research. Um, like I said, Valerie Hunt was looking at the microvoltage range. So beginning into those smaller, more minute, you know, capabilities of being able to sense more and more uh, with sensitivity and accuracy with these technologies. Um, and they also have more high definition uh, cameras now with thermal imaging, so you can see a lot more. They've been really popular with the uh, coronavirus, people being able to just take a quick picture of a person and see, hmm. you know, what their weather's like, are they too hot? Or, you know, do they have a fever? So, um, those, those are definitely, and then there's also the poly contrast interference photography. This was developed by Harry Oldfield, and this uses a full spectrum light. This is similar to um, like how you are able to see the galaxies and through a telescope. How the sun, you know, you, you take pictures at night, so the sun is behind. The sunlight hits a gas particle and bounces back, and based on the phase angle that it bounces back, it's a certain color which gives you, uh, tells you whether it's hydrogen or nitrogen in that atmosphere. And so you can suddenly with these filters, you can see these, uh, these clouds around the stars. So with this um, PIP, polycontrast interference photography, you take a full spectrum light and you shine it onto a person and you see how it bounces back. You can see how it, uh, the light intensity around a person might increase as you're doing energy work. Um, you might be able to see shifts on the on the body on where it's absorbing light or is it reflecting light. So that's been another uh, useful tool to be able to see those changes. Um, and then I have the Lesher antenna. That one's like I said, it's a little bit more low tech. Um, mm -hmm. That's measuring Lesher lines and high frequency. Field, so you can um, kind of get an idea of the, the volume of a person standing here. Um, how far out are they emitting this particular high frequency? Okay, out three feet. Okay, now what about this frequency? And you can measure it out. Okay, this frequency gets emanated out four feet. So you get more of an idea of the different changes in atmospheric uh, pressure and volume at these different kind of ranges of the body. Now, does 
those do those particular frequencies tell you if someone is depleted or fatigued or what do those different frequencies show you yes are they emitting this frequency or not mm. you know and how strongly are they emitting this frequency are they shining you know brightly all over or you know as the signal weak mm -hmm. you know so it's finding where you've got weak signals uh, and where there's you know not as much energy kind of emanating from certain parts of the body so right right and you also mentioned now i don't know if this is biofield related but the green laser is that related to this type of work as so well that, yeah that was one of the you know early inspires for this research into energy medicine was the green laser like i said coherent light i had um met Dr. Jay Shim in Boulder and he, uh, what he did was he muscle tested, which for me, I didn't know what that was, mm -hmm. um, but I could feel when my muscles would tighten and when they would go really soft and he would be asking me about different ages in my life, like age four when I moved as a kid, um, age 18 when it was a big step moving out. Like there were certain years that really stood out in my life and he could pick them out. And so uh, that kind of blew me away. And then he had me lay down and think about um, these different ages. And some of them I didn't really have a real memory for. I just thought, you know, okay, I'm four, I'm four, I'm four. And I could feel changes in my body. I could feel my, it was like an elephant was standing on my chest. And then suddenly it was like taking its foot off. I was like, wow, it feels so much lighter. And, um, and so then I started, like I said, when I was with Elizabeth Rauscher, she had uh, introduced me to Tina Carew's work, K-A-R-U, and how she was shining different colored lasers onto cells and seeing what happens when you shine a different laser, different color, what happens. So red laser, it's a really stimulating red, the first color in the spectrum. And so that creates cell division. Mm -hmm. and that's why they're using a lot of red lights for you know facials these days. Um, and green light, Green lasers helped with ATP production, which is uh, your energy. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I was introduced to, um, through Steve Ross at the World Research Foundation, the work of Dinshaw Gadiali, who does spectrochrometry. So he was using light to heal the body, but it, this wasn't laser light, it was just shining a light. Uh, and he always started every session with green because it's the middle of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if something needed to more energy to, you know, it could use that green to come more into balance. If it needed to relax, it could also use that green to come into balance. And then if it needed more, then he would choose a specific color. But um, so that that's why I, I was like green, obviously it's neutral. It helps bring the body to neutral. And same thing with tuning forks and the coherent sound, tuning forks act as an adaptogen. So when, tuning fork is introduced to your field and it hits an area where it goes really high or the sound goes really low. Mm -hmm. The tuning fork, it's like if you had a guitar that's in tune and one that's out of tune, you keep giving it the in tune note, the other person can make whatever subtle adjustments. So you're putting this adaptogen into their system and they're hearing where it gets high and their body is auto tuning themselves to help bring it back into that neutral state. So, and the work that I do now is I combine those two. So I use coherent light and coherent sound at the same time mm -hmm. and use the tuning fork to kind of trigger, uh, you know, and find those areas of dissonance in their field uh, while the light is con constantly also helping to bring them to neutral. So it's kind of a wafting and weaving of light and sound. Mm -hmm. So it's really fascinating, lots of amazing shifts uh, in people. Yeah, when you were initially talking about the uh, muscle testing and finding, asking questions about age and relation, that really does remind me of the biofield anatomy and that Eileen talks about. And so, how how does our biofield react to sound? You you've described it briefly, but a lot of times I have people ask me about the electric body. Well, what does that have to do with sound? How how do those relate to yeah. each other, if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, that, that goes back to that electromagnetic spectrum that I was saying before, where you've got infrasound, sound, 
ultrasound, you know, and then you go into infrared light, visible light, ultraviolet, and it keeps stepping up in these different harmonics and octaves of each other. So sound is electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. So when we use a tuning fork and I first find that edge of the field that I mentioned, that kind of charged double plasma membrane, um, it feels like I'm hitting electricity. It feels like I'm hitting a little, little firecracker of electricity. And eventually what will happen is that kind of firecracker, or that kind of buzz that I might find there eventually kind of softens. And instead of hitting a high pressure system, like I'm hitting a cloud and I'm stopped, it's like the cloud melts away and I can start to move in closer to the body. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that, that tuning fork, it also, that's magnetic. So I use the tuning fork like a magnet. So once that electric charge lets go, then I use the tuning fork like a magnet to help bring it back in towards the body. And this is what the body actually, it sometimes even feels like a vacuum, like it's pulling the tuning fork in, in closer to the body. So what Eileen had found when she was working with this, um, this anatomy map is that at the outside edge of the field, she found information related to a person's um, inheritance, like what they came pre-programmed into this life with, we call it inner genetics, so the energy of your genes. And then as you move into the middle of the plasma membrane, it can hold information related to gestation. So when you're plugged into your mom, your umbilical cord is like an electrical cord. And so what your mom's feeling, you're feeling. So if your mom was really depressed when she was pregnant, you bring a tuning fork in to that area, you can hear the sound just completely drop off. Mm -hmm. Or if, when your mom was pregnant, she was running around trying to do all of these things. Then you can also bring it in and it can sound really chaotic in that area. And so then as you move into the inside of that plasma membrane, you find information related to birth uh, and what the birth was like. So if somebody was a C-section or uh, an emergency um, surgery situation, then you can hear those changes uh, right there. It can sound really sharp and really high frequency. Or if somebody almost died, it's like the sound will almost drop right out of the fork. So, the, you know, that's your boundary. That really sounds, you know, it's a lot of information there at that edge of the field um, that oftentimes people don't even think of or they're not even aware of um, how this kind of ancestral programming could be affecting. So, you know, our ancestors living through a Great Depression, oof, you know, we're, we can hear that in the field. Or World War One, World War Two, all of these wars, you can hear. Um, the influence, you know, especially if somebody was born right before, or during a war, you can hear that uh, in their timeline. So as you move from that outside edge and you start moving closer into the body, it's like uh, rings on a tree. So every time you go around the sun, you have another birthday, you get another ring in your tree. So if a person is um, 40 years old and you start to move in and you hit a spot about halfway through their timeline, that would be something that happened at age 20, where they kind of released that some energy, release some charge, whether it's sadness or chaos. Um, you can hear that in the tuning fork, and they can hear that those changes in the tuning fork, and uh, their body can hear it. And so you don't even have to think, you know, that whether the tuner or the person receiving. You just straight, I say I'm a tuning fork operator because I just come in and I find these areas and their body's doing the work. You know, I just hold the tuning fork and their body auto tunes itself. And so we bring all of these areas of charge that normally are, are consuming electricity, you know, it's consuming our energy to have all of this charge at the edge of our field related to birth. So we bring that electricity, like I said, like a magnet. We work our way into the center, into that midline. Like I said, we have a nerve plexus. Um, that's like a little bundle of nerves that's just waiting for this electricity. So we bring that charge back into center. Again, let the body auto-tune itself. So we uh, give it multiple opportunities to hear and reflect what it sounds like. So then we clear the space right in front of the body and how that person is expressing themselves in the present moment. You know, a lot of people 
um, can put up a lot of charge, a lot of fear between them and the outside world. And as that starts to open up, more energy can flow, you know, in those directions, you know, out and they can be more um, expressive rather than suppressive, which is what we want. We want people to shine. Now you've been doing this biofield tuning for, for many years now. I'm just curious early on when you were first wor working with the tuning fork, were there like any aha wow moments that you're like, Oh, okay, absolutely. This is a tool that does this. <laughs> I have all kinds of like, I'm still, I've been tuning and I still learn mm -hmm. wild stuff all the time. Um, you know, I worked on a Vietnam vet and, um, it was, I was working through his field and I got to about age 20, which is when he would have been going, gone, going to Vietnam. And like I said, the tuning fork can sometimes feel like a magnet. It pulled me straight through the twenties. Like we're not even going there yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I, I could tune from like 30 on and he was like, you know, how come that didn't show up? And his body just wasn't ready for it. Mm -hmm. So then the next session, you know, I was able to go in and start to work on some so he could address some of those issues once we cleared some other like childhood and things that didn't happen at, you know post vietnam then we were able to in the second session really address it and when i got into that part in his field i could feel in my fingertips helicopter blades <laughs> like that's what i felt and i was like oh my gosh of course those helicopter you know those torsion fields created by those helicopter blades probably really disturb a person's energy field. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really cool um, to experience. And then I think I was more excited about it than he was for sure, <laughs> but like, oh my God. <laughs> um, and then uh, I had, you know, I have somebody who doesn't have any memory, you know, before age 11. And when I work in her, in her field, it, that's what it feels like. It feels like there's just a little cloud. I just like float right through 11. And then I can start interacting with some of the things, um, you know, that she knows and can remember and can reflect on and be like, yes, I was charged at those different ages, but because she doesn't even know mm -hmm. what before there, I mean, every time I work on her, it's just like, and I'm through it, going through a cloud and now here you are. So it's really uh, been quite fascinating. And, um, and one of the things I've, been really interested in is working with couples. So, um, you know, you work with people one-on-one -on -one for so long that after a while you want to, you know, help them in their relationship and their, how they can communicate with the uh, people in their life. So, um, working with husband and wife, you know, father and daughter, those types of any kind of relationship and, and helping smooth out and bring more coherence, more clarity, more communication, um, like I said, it helps with if things are really suppressed mm -hmm. and you know, kind of bottled up, you know, that can lead to disease. So being able to ah, express things and get them off their chest and uh, come to a better understanding of, you know, what and why people may uh, be the way that they are and be able to approach them with more love and compassion. You know, couples who are like, wow, I didn't even know about this thing that you were that you went through in the first grade you know, that they, they, you know, they're now sharing in this session and they're like, well, no wonder every time I do this, that you get so upset and you get so charged is because that's just like what you said somebody did to you in the first grade. So then they, the partner can have that like, oh, and have a lot of love and compassion for their partner for responding in that way. And then maybe try not to do that again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And you also find that when these areas of charge get cleared out of the field, then you get less triggered. You're like, oh, you know, every time they used to do that, I used to get really upset and now they're doing it and I don't even feel phased. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I'm coherent and grounded and I'm not upset and I can respond from a really clear, my truth and, and, and have clear communication. So, um, you know, with this quarantine and people being locked down, there's been a lot of domestic violence and, um, you know, people not being able to connect with one another. And I really believe that what the world needs now is love, mm -hmm. sweet love. So that's my mission. Mm -hmm. And, you know, during this time, or, or perhaps once we, we get past the quarantine, what part of your work is most 
important right now, whether it's biofield tuning or other projects? What research do you see um, coming forth? Well, I've been, you know, since I've been locked down with a thermal imaging camera, I've, <laughs> I've been interested in doing research into distance sessions. Mm -hmm. So um, I had the thermal camera pointed on myself and I had Elena Marani. She's a board certified naturopath. Uh, she and I graduated biofield tuning together mm. uh, and she's just been an amazing woman. She did some work with Jerry Tennant who wrote the book Healing is Voltage mm -hmm. and had specialized in tuning teeth. Mm. Uh, so she was tuning my wisdom teeth from a distance and her partner, um, Dr. Gregory Hyde, he's an MD who specializes in ear, nose and throat. Mm -hmm. So um, we did a thermal imaging of, you know, seeing my before, during, and we actually did a video this time. So we're getting some of the audio of that together. They also did some work on my sinuses and they tuned my throat and my brow. And we were able to capture the thermal changes. You know, they'd strike the fork and you'd see my sinuses just like pulsing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's allergy season. And um, so, yeah, it's been uh, interesting doing that kind of research. But like I said, I think... Um, my real focus in the future is, is working with, with couples. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my, my goal is to keep working with, with people who really want to have a lot of love and respect for each other and want to have that clear and open communication. Mm -hmm. So that's my goal. That's really cool, though, that during this time you're able to research distance sessions a bit. I know that a lot of people have asked me, well, how does that work, you know, and a lot of it's experiential and getting feedback and that shows that, you know, both the, the practitioner and the person receiving does experience the same thing, but that you're actually able to see some imaging on that is really, really cool. It's really fun to see. I remember I remember when Eileen was, didn't believe that it was possible mm -hmm. to do a field tuning from a distance and she was like, hey, will you mind if I try? And I could definitely feel um, her working on me mm -hmm. and you know what parts of the body I were, was noticing. She wasn't on the phone while she was doing it, but I wrote to her. I was like, you know, I could feel this and this and this. And she was like, oh my gosh, I was tuning this, you know, that same area. So I could definitely sense it. And then when I first tried it and I was like, yeah, I was kind of shy and kind of like, I think this is really weird, you know, coming from a bioengineering <laughs> background. And so I told my mom, I was like, mom, I just learned this weird new thing. Um, I'll just do it while you're sleeping. Just go to bed at 1030 and I'm going to give you a tune up. And she's like, yeah, okay, cool. That sounds fine. She can go. She's like, I can go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so I start, you know, I intend that her hologram is there on the bed and start tuning. And I was, could not believe how much I could feel. I was like, oh my gosh, this, I'm feeling this. This is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Um, so that blew my mind years ago. Um, so now finally being able to have a technology where we can see it, mm -hmm. but you know, it's working through the ethers. You know, how are you and I even having this conversation? It's all in the ether, right. in the ether waves. So it's, um, and it's in our thoughts and our intentions. So being able to put your intention and attention towards something, um, anything's possible. So I was just saying that's what I love about being able to research the biofield is that, you know, endless the potential things that we can study mm -hmm. absolutely and as coming from the background that you did and then kind of merging your biomedical experience with the alternative medicine do you find any resistance or is this kind of research pretty widely received well it's what's interesting is um you know more and more people are coming around to it mm -hmm. When I first started, you know, a lot of my peers in bioengineering just thought I was crazy, you know, wave, like, let me wave this green <laughs> laser on you. you know? <laughs> He's lost it. Um, and, and doing muscle testing, they also thought that was, you know, quite weird. And now more and more of my um, scientist friends are, are looking into it. I get, go back. I, one of my favorite professors at uh, Mississippi State University is Dr. Philip Toe. And so I've been able to go back and... Um, you know, give him tune-ups and get his feedback. And he's pretty fascinated by those kinds of things. And um, 
we've got supercomputers there at Mississippi State too. He was like, we could definitely do some research, but there's no funding for it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's being able to, you know, hopefully inspire more bioelectromagnetic research. We're, we're studying more physics than chemistry because, you know, after overseeing those clinical trials, I'm just, ugh, you know, with chemistry, Albert Einstein says physics trumps chemistry. So why not go use physics mm -hmm. and coherent light and coherent sound, you know, makes sense. And a non-invasive thermal camera, which is detecting your, the heat, your body's radiating from you to the camera, rather than putting radiation into you, like a mammogram is putting x-ray radiation into the body. Uh, it just seems like a more uh, natural, less invasive way to look look and treat it, the body. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been my focus for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, excellent. Well, I know that your your website has a lot of great information. What's the best way for people to to see what you're doing? Um, you know, kind of keep up to to date on this research and uh, just anything else that you would like to share. Um, yeah, I just think that, uh, I also have the, uh, in my additional research tab on my website, biofieldlab.com, uh, we have a, a link to Shamini Jen and the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, Chi, uh, their resources for, uh, biofield research papers, healing papers. There's over 6,000 papers that they've put together and it's an incredible resource. And so I just want to help. Um, promote and give them a shout out for all the work that they've been doing uh, for biofield science because it hasn't been an easy feat and what they've done is pretty incredible. So that's in the additional research page. And I also have some of the congressional hearings on radiation health and safety, which show the how the EEG changes, the, the ch changes in brain waves when people are exposed to AM and FM radio. So this goes back to the 1970s. So there's a lot of good research papers that you can download um, and, and read more about um, uh, how the body responds to electromagnetic fields. Right. And I mean, does, does that show, this might be getting into too deep of a rabbit hole, but is, is there mm -hmm. sound that harms us or these waves like 5G? Uh, of course, there's probably not too much research on that, but could that be detrimental? Well, with the AM and FM research, you know, it was showing that certain frequencies would decrease the alpha brain waves and desynchronize them. So they would kind of go off kilter, you know, and they would have the radio off. So the person wouldn't know when it was on and when it was off. Mm. Um, but, and then they were monitoring their brain waves and some people, um, and this is where you have critical thinking, problem solving, that type of thing. And some of the people in the research study had it put them in a six hertz frequency associated with annoyance mm -hmm. and frustration. So people, you know, even with AM and FM back then, people weren't able to think critically and were getting frustrated right. um, with some of these frequencies. And they knew that, but because of the, you know, it's used in the military and, and our, you know, safety and security, um, they said that that, you know, was negligible and we'll just, we're just going to keep doing it, you know, despite that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, that since then, it's gone up a billion, billion, billion times, 13 zeros. And probably more than that, when I was in India, they were saying a tower every hour. Mm. Um, so they haven't even done any studies to see, or I haven't seen any um you know, what does the EEGs change when you put a 5G phone to your temple? Right. Like, I already know that AM and FM radio can can decrease your alpha brain waves. And I don't even want to know what 3,000 3, new frequencies in the air mm -hmm. are going to do. We, we don't have that research. Um, we know that 60 gigahertz can can put the oxygen molecule into a spin to where it can't attach to hemoglobin in the blood. And so that can affect your breathing, obviously, and your ability to um, live. So that's a very important, you know, it's important to take into consideration what frequencies we know can harm the body. And if we can, we know that there's frequencies that can heal the body and be beneficial to the body 
So why not use those frequency bands? Right. Why not focus on emanating and, and sending out and we, our phones can operate on frequencies that are going to benefit our field mm -hmm. rather than create noise and disturbance. When I saw the movie Kingsman, mm -hmm. um, where they have particular frequencies that set people off and they get so annoyed, they start fighting each other. Right, right. I was like, that's like AM and FM radio, but on, you know, on a bigger scale, you know, AM and FM putting people in a state of frustration. If that would have been, you know, turned up or amped up, you know, people could get more and more uh, frustrated with each other and, you know, not be able to connect in a loving and compassionate way with one another because there's dissonance in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would just think as technology continues to increase daily, yearly, um, any harmful issues will also increase. So anything that we can do to counter that with, with sound and, and this biofield science, it's just necessary. It, I mean, it has to be there. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for, for the work you're doing and for, for sharing this with us and it just kind of bringing more of a, a background and understanding to uh, this biofield that we talk so much about in sound work. It's just nice to know that um, you're such an advocate as, as a researcher for getting more, more of an understanding and, and bringing all this to light. So thank you and, and keep at it. And I will be definitely following um, what you're up to. Well, thank you so much for having me, Natalie. It's been a real honor and a, and a pleasure to, to be here and to share about, you know, this work that I've been doing. So thank you for giving me a, a chance to share that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, lots of love. Thanks again, Natalie. Thank you too. All right. Take care. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Sounds Heal Podcast, sponsored by the Ohm Shop and Spa. And keep up to date with what's coming up next at soundshealstudio.com. Check things out on Facebook at Sounds Heal Studio. And you can listen to all previous podcasts, as well as music meditations, on the YouTube channel at Sounds Heal Studio. Be well and stay tuned. <laughs>